In 2014, Larian Studios birthed the perfect hybrid of video games and RPGs, and just when D&D enthusiasts everywhere thought it couldn't get any better, they received a second coming. Hey, I'm Jacob with the Leaderboard, and here are 107 facts you should know about Divinity Original Sin 2. And before we get started, don't forget to subscribe and click the bell icon to become part of our notification squad. Alright, let's gear up. <laughs> Divinity Original Sin 2 is a role-playing game developed by Belgian developer Larian Studios. Unsurprisingly, it's the sequel to 2014's Divinity Original Sin. The game was initially announced on August 12, 2015, with Larian promising the project would be their most ambitious RPG ever. One of the team's main goals was to make sure that the player's origin story would continue to influence aspects of the game from beginning to end. This differed from most RPGs in that the origin often only affects a few critical moments of gameplay rather than the entire plot. While the first game focused on the Source Hunters seeking to rid the world of Source and Sorcerers, the sequel follows Sorcerers who have been stripped of their powers and sent away to find a cure. The game was directed by Larian Studios founder Sven Vink. Vink has been directing the Divinity games since 2002. A Kickstarter campaign for the sequel was launched in August of 2015. The game reached its $500,000 goal in less than 12 hours. By comparison, the original game required 12 full days before its $400,000 goal was met. While Larian used Kickstarter to fully fund the original game, the Kickstarter funds for the sequel were only used to include additional content that would spice up the experience, like more skill schools, talents, abilities, and spells. The cash flow on the game's Kickstarter was so quick and fierce that the campaign surpassed a few of its stretch goals before Larian even had a chance to announce what they were. One reason the developers headed back to Kickstarter for the sequel was because they wanted to interact with their fanbase directly and receive feedback as to what content and features they would like to see in the sequel. Though people voiced their opinions and provided plenty of feedback during the game's early access build, the decision to incorporate certain changes ultimately boiled down to what director Sven Vink thought best suited the game. One stretch goal in particular was Strategist Mode. A spiritual successor to the first game's Tactician Mode, Strategist Mode touched up and redesigned every fight in the game so that the enemy AI would appear smarter and more numerous. The mode also grants them abilities that they would never use on other difficulties. After 35 days, the Kickstarter campaign accumulated 42,713 backers who tossed in a collective $2,032,434 toward the development of Divinity Original Sin 2, with an additional $43,000 from PayPal for good measure. Early access for the game began in September of 2016. All Kickstarter backers were given access to the game's first act, Fort Joy. Throughout early access, 21.6 of all attribute points players spent went towards intelligence, making it the most popular aspect of the game. The least popular attribute was memory, which came in at a measly 9.7%. One bit of the early access feedback that surprised Vink was people's disdain for the physical and magic armors. Though he thought they enhanced the experience, players of the first game found that the armors made their old strategies obsolete. Larian incorporated split-screen co-op for the game after the developer learned that a large demographic of players were actually couples. This feature made the gaming experience much more intimate. Whereas the previous game only allowed for a two-player co-op experience, Original Sin 2 allows up to four players to play with each other simultaneously. This feature was impossible in the original game, but was fixed due to Larian's new engine. Now the game can not only be played cooperatively, but competitively too, with Larian providing players many opportunities to face off against members of their party. Players can do anything from giving their opponents poisoned health vials to flat-out stabbing them in the back or even getting NPCs to turn on their allies. One challenge in development was figuring out if the four-player PvP could work within Divinity Original Sin 2's sandbox. They built an entire prototype around the concept and had many players test the game until they reached a final result. So much work was done on the sequel's engine and art style that Larian made things a bit harder in regards to development. They were unable to reuse just about every asset left over from the first game. Getting rid of all the old stuff proved to be just as difficult. Much like the first Divinity Original Sin, developers attempted to incorporate a day-night cycle into the sequel, but it was ultimately scrapped due to a lack of resources. Divinity Original Sin 2 was initially developed as a Windows PC exclusive, but it wasn't intended to remain exclusive. Larian focused on getting the PC version done first so that they didn't lose time developing multiple builds for multiple platforms at the same time. The most challenging part when developing the game was making sure that details in the origin stories lined up with the player's avatar and companion playthrough. In other words, the writers had to make sure that stories meshed well with the massive overarching narrative without getting too messy. Larian significantly fine-tuned their enemy AI to make it a bigger pain in the ass for players. With the cleverly named AI, 2.0, the enemies don't just blow up barrels and toss fireballs, but they also become aware of their surroundings and utilize their knowledge. They can even manipulate surfaces, use statuses against players,
players and utilize spells in ways that developers never thought possible. AI 2.0 proved to be so devious and efficient that the developers had to turn it off and replace it with a dumber system for the lower difficulties. The Hall of Echoes was originally intended to serve as the player's home base in the game and even had some functionality at some point. The designation of home base was later given to the warship Lady Vengeance. Game Master Mode was designed to be the digital counterpart of the custom tabletop RPG campaigns of old, allowing players to create any adventure their hearts desired. If Game Master Mode proves to be a bit difficult for you to learn, the game comes packed with hundreds of pre-made maps which can be studied thoroughly to customize your adventures. The Divinity Engine Editor allows players to create maps of their dreams and perhaps other players' nightmares. You can tweak anything from the atmosphere, ambiance, weather, and time of day. You can even fine-tune your map with a variety of music. Not only can players fill their maps with enemies from the base game's rogues gallery, but they can also download player-created enemies from the Steam Workshop and import them into their map. Characters can also receive unique skills and different names. With the game's vignette system, the player can add NPC dialogue, narration, and difficult choices. They can even add original graphics, and create additional dialogue options any time of day. As the Game Master, players can attempt to stop anybody from completing their map by assuming direct control of any enemy or NPC. The diverse playable races were added into the game as a request by the fanbase. These races were provided with different looks, with each having distinct abilities and traits that impact gameplay. To remedy the difficulty players endured when crafting items in the first game, the developers decided to revamp the user interface so that it was more open to experimentation. Developers also brought in a list of recipes that could be compiled either by logging travel, or by word of mouth via NPCs. Unlike many developers in the industry, Larian is very supportive of the modding community. In fact, the studio invited several professionals into their office to assist them in creating the game's modding tools to make them more accessible to a wider audience. Continuing the trend of supporting modders, Larian Studios recently showcased some choice mods, including a soccer mod and a mod that turns the character creation part of the game into the old-school Ultima style of character creation. In case it wasn't obvious, Larian Studios cares a lot about its community. But did you know that in in Original Sin 2, they included a character that was entirely developed by the GOG.com forums. The fan-created character... Oh god, GOG, why couldn't you have picked a name that was easy to pronounce? Aethne? Aethne? Google tells me Enya? This character was entirely designed, inspired, and chosen by GOG.com communities. This was accomplished by running contests on the website where users got to draw pictures and design what she looks like. She's even fully voiced and has her own unique backstory. In many game franchises, the games typically tend to become easier in later installments. The developers of Original Sin 2 didn't quite cave to that pressure, opting to make the sequel every bit as challenging as the original, if not more so. The developers believe that their fan base appreciates the learning curve complexity of the gameplay, and if not, well, there's always co-op. Divinity Original Sin 2 features so many choices and actions that the developers were constantly discovering their effects and outcomes throughout development. While the first game had just one writer, the number of writers in the room for the sequel rose to eight. The larger writing team allowed them to incorporate the player character's personality, class, race, and backstory into every corner of the game. Whereas the lore of the first game was created on the fly, the writers made an effort to better solidify every narrative thread in the sequel by creating a lore book. This piece of literature covered everything about the game's world and its history. Most studios tend to keep their story bibles locked away in a safe. Instead, Larian released Divinity Original Sin 2's lore book to the public so that fans could get the most out of the game's more complicated narrative. One of the writers on the game was none other than the acclaimed RPG scribe Chris Avalon. Chris is best known for contributing to the stories of games like Fallout New Vegas, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic 2, and Pillars of Eternity. Avalon wasn't hired to write for the game from the get-go. His involvement was actually suggested by the fanbase who joked that Avalon would make for a good Kickstarter stretch goal. Sven contacted Chris on Twitter, and the two hit it off at PAX, and the rest, they say, is Christery. Larian decided to place a considerable amount of focus on the sequel's narrative due to the criticism of the first game's story. According to writer Sarah Bayless, the team constantly refers back to similar stories of the same genre to make sure that their game is as fresh and unique as it can possibly be. The writers wanted to incorporate romance into the game organically. They wanted to flesh out characters in such a way that their flirtation seemed to drive the narrative and not the other way around. With regards to the timeline, Original Sin 2 takes place in the Divinity series timeline well after Divine Divinity, but before the game Beyond Divinity, the center of a Divinity sandwich, if you will. The game's release date was pushed back to September of 2017 so that Larian could ensure that every line of dialogue in the game was voiced adequately. Evidently, this was an issue that had come up in the past and needed to be corrected. Over 80 actors participated in the recording of the game's dialogue. It's said that the actors collectively recorded over 74,000 lines. 
The staff was pretty dissatisfied with the first round of performances. As a result, toward the end of development, they brought many of the voice actors back to completely re-record all of the dialogue from scratch with very little time to spare. Some standouts amongst the game's militia of voice actors are Harry Hayden Payton, who you might recognize as one of the male Inquisitors from Dragon Age Inquisition, Alex Wilton Reagan, who provided the voice of one of the female Inquisitors, as well as Samantha Trainer in Mass Effect 3, and Alec Newman, who played Graydon in The Witcher 3. Tamron Payne, the voice of Lose, considers recording her first ever musical single to be a particular highlight of voicing the character. The voice actors didn't just get into the booth, record a few thousand lines, and call it a day. They utilized motion capture, performing the character's choreography as well. The game's sound was designed to utilize a method known as dynamic mixing, which substantially lowers and heightens certain sounds depending on a scene. For example, if the characters are talking in front of a raging fire, the fire's crackling will drop while the dialogue momentarily becomes the most audible sound. A lot of work went into making the ambience of the game feel real. For example, every time a character enters a new area, players can pick up a diverse array of sounds that are almost random in sequence. Each setting samples from a vast library of ambient tracks, so no matter how many times you return to a place, its sounds will be a little different. Borislav Slalov composed Divinity Original Sin 2's epic soundtrack. If you've played Crisis 2, Crisis 3, and Rise Son of Rome, you've heard his work before. Divinity Original Sin 2 is the first Larian Studios game that was not to be scored by composer Kirill Pokrovsky. The composer had passed away in 2015. Pokrovsky had been providing music for Larian titles for nearly 20 years, beginning with Lead Wars back in 1997. Slalov was chosen to replace Pokrovsky due to the developer's belief that his music is adaptive and evolves based on the actions a player takes. Slalov previously had never thought about working for Larian despite being a fan. He agreed to join the team because he enjoyed Pokrovsky's work so much. As a tribute to the late Pokrovsky, Borislav recorded a rendition of the former composer's most memorable piece, Power of Innocence, to appear in the final game. Now, onto the game itself. Divinity focuses on Lose, who isn't your average singer and performer. Her mind is a playground for sprites, spirits, and unknown entities. A darker voice takes up residence inside of her head, fighting for control of her very being. Lose must figure out what this force is and and how to get it out. Then we have the Red Prince, a brilliant general of the House of War who was destined to become the next emperor of his people. But the prince's plan comes to naught when it's discovered that he was cavorting with demons. He's exiled as a result. Hunted by assassins, the Red Prince is determined to rise up and take back the throne that is rightfully his. A former slave tasked with hunting her kind, Sibyl managed to escape the shackles of her villainous master. She bears a scar that serves as a reminder of her enslavement, which motivates her to seek out revenge on her former master. Ben Mezd is a military crusader sworn to protect the Divine Lucian with his own life. After witnessing so many innocent lives taken in the name of the Divine Order, he lost faith in his former superiors and became a prized assassin for hire to the Lone Wolves. His story revolves around his contract to kill Lucian's son. Marcus Miles led a rebellion against the tyrannical Dwarf Queen and failed. As punishment, he was cast away and left to die, but made it out of his death sentence and took on a new life on the high seas with a new identity, Beast. Beast has learned of the Queen's newest dastardly plot and sets out on a journey to foil those plans and ultimately get revenge. The race you choose to play as isn't just purely aesthetic. Your choice affects the gameplay in a multitude of ways. For example, playing as a dwarf may prevent you from entering specific areas. The lizard race is known for forming the world's oldest empire and the most important culture. Legend has it that they're the descendants of dragons, but this may or may not be a lie designed to make them look cool. Dwarves are organized, cunning, pragmatic, and of course, brutal to boot. They're so cruel, in fact, that their empire is known to wipe out entire cities just to serve as an example to others. The undead are a result of dying folks refusing the call to the Hall of Echoes. Why would anyone do such a thing? Well, some people just don't trust the myths, and those that have led immoral lives believe they'll be punished if they answer the call, while others are filled with grief that prevents them from leaving the mortal realm. There are different types of undead. The ones that have been torn from the Hall of Echoes by necromancers are known as the Raised Ones, while the ones that are kept out of eternity and wander around for too long become the Faint Ones. Not all of the undead are your typical brain-eating stereotypes. The Chosen Ones are a civilized race of undead that have been known to dress in finery, discuss philosophy, and seek no source from the souls surrounding them. Being an undead character is the most challenging race to play. Interacting with NPCs becomes difficult when players reveal that they are, in fact, undead. This declaration prompts them to either run away in fear or attack the character on sight. 
No one playable character in the game forces the player to align with good or evil. Players can pick whatever side they desire without the game pushing them in either direction. Just like every other game in recent memory except for Dark Souls, Divinity Original Sin 2 features a Dark Souls reference. In Act 2, in the Sewers of Arcs, you can find a campfire with an uncoiled sword sticking out of it, just like the bonfires found throughout the Dark Souls franchise. You have the ability to kill any character within the game, just be forewarned that killing certain characters brings about dramatic consequences. There are two means of selecting a character in the game. Either a player gets creative and molds one from scratch, or they can take the impatient route and choose a pre-made character all set and ready to go. Watch how you treat your companions. While showing them respect grants you their undying loyalty and perhaps steamier outcomes, addressing them cruelly can lead to abandonment or worse. Larian has been known to describe Fort Joy not as Alcatraz, but as a haunted leper colony on an island surrounded by sharks with tentacles. Before players reach Fort Joy, they should meet a black cat that's anything but bad luck. If players obtain the pet pal talent, they can communicate with the feline and get it to follow them. If players manage to keep their feline friend alive through the perilous journey to Fort Joy, it will become a new companion with a useful teleportation ability. During the character creation process, players can choose a musical instrument to associate with their character. This selection influences the musical score and themes that accompany characters on their journey, adding yet another unexpected bit of uniqueness to a player's session. Though one might begin at rock bottom while washing up on a beach, there are a few secrets that can make the playing experience a tad more comfortable. Look for a partially crumbled platform nearby. It houses a bedroll that allows the party to heal outside of battle quickly. Players can also find a shovel which can be used to unearth quite a few treasures, thus filling up the inventory much earlier. This has been Divinity Pro Tips with the Leaderboard. Even if the player is hesitant, they should show interest in Gawain's plan. After heading to the beach, which he marks on your map, kill the pack of crocodiles that inhabit the setting to retrieve teleportation gloves. Upon returning to Gawain, follow him until he eventually dies to complete the quest and permanently obtain those highly useful gloves, which, as the name suggests, allows for teleportation in various scenarios. The Pet Pal skill lets you embrace your inner Eliza Thornberry and allows you to talk to animals. Not only does this bring up some pretty humorous dialogue, but you can also unlock secret quests. Unlike vendors in most video games, the vendors in Divinity Original Sin 2 switch up their stock every 30 minutes of real time, so players should check back often and stock up on as many goods as they can. A player's level is another factor that affects a vendor's stock. The higher a player's level is, the shinier and more valuable their wares will become, but don't get too excited because not every vendor will receive new stock with every level up. While you may be scratching your head at the game's odd title, Larian claims that they chose the title not because they wanted to maintain the marketability, but because the title still makes sense regarding the story. It, no spoilers here, by the way. Players can combine skills to create entirely new ones using the cleverly titled skill crafting mechanism. For example, if a person happens to combine a necromancy spell with a fire spell, they'll unlock the compelling and funny corpse explosion ability. Though you are allowed to roam freely in the game, your current skill level may halt your progress if you can't beat a a certain boss in order to advance. There's no option regarding sexual orientation during the character creation process, so your character can romance whoever their heart desires. Though it may cost you quite a bit of gold in the short term, you might want to gift your favorite vendor several items to get on their good side. Then they'll not only offer you discounted prices on their goods, but they'll also buy your stuff for much more. One of the most useful items in the game is the Chicken Claw, which as the name suggests, turns your opponent into a chicken for several rounds, leaving them completely vulnerable. It even works on bosses that are ordinarily immune to status effects. Players can mix various elements in the game. Combining fire and poison will create an explosion that will simultaneously burn and poison foes. Meshing fire and water will also create a smoke screen that will cloak players from ranged attacks. There's no real penalty or danger to a companion dying, as their corpse will remain in the same spot indefinitely until you're able to resurrect them with a healing item. They can wait. Pickpocketing has been a long way to get rich quick in video games, but Divinity Original Sin 2 makes the deed more complex than it's ever been. First off, the loot players receive isn't entirely random, but based on their thieving skill. Bored with your character but don't want a completely fresh start? Below the deck of the ship Lady Vengeance is a mirror that allows you to rebuild the stats of both you and your party as many times as you'd like. At a glance, the blast spell appears to be as simple as increasing resistance, accuracy, and dodging, but it has more applications that the game doesn't explicitly mention. Bless can also be used to remove curses from objects, cleanse hellfire, and turn ordinary water into healing ponds. If a player's strength is high enough, they'll be able to pick up barrels with varying properties. From those that choke enemies to 
death with poison gas to others that just go boom. Players can carry these barrels to just about any location on the map, allowing individuals to get creative and set up elaborate traps for unsuspecting enemies. Larian made a deal with Dungeons & Dragons publisher Wizards of the Coast that allowed them to demo the Game Master mode using an in-game rendition of the Lost Mind of Fendelver module. In case you don't know what that is, it's one of the most recognizable D&D campaigns of all time. When releasing the early access build, the team encountered a problem launching the game on Steam and were puzzled by the technical difficulties behind it. They later realized that the game wouldn't start because the developers forgot to press a specific button. Whoops. The game was first shown to the public at PAX Prime 2015, in which Larian demoed a playable prototype for the audience to experience. On the day that the game was launched, Larian's home city of Ghent, Belgium was hit by a massive blackout caused by a fire. Even after the team temporarily moved to a location with power, they still had trouble getting the game onto Steam through the uploader. Despite all of their bad luck, however, Larian was eventually able to launch the game on September 14th of 2017. Despite the rocky slash fiery launch, Divinity Original Sin 2 became Larian's most successful release to date, reeling in a whopping 75,000 concurrent players in its first week. This impressive number made the game the fourth most populated game on Steam, only to be beaten by PlayerUnknown's Battlegrounds, Counter-Strike Global Offensive, and Dota 2. While Larian originally expected to only sell just 500,000 copies by Christmas of 2017, their expectations were wildly surpassed when Divinity Original Sin 2 sold over 700,000 copies within three weeks of launch. By November of 2017, it had passed the milestone of 1 million copies sold. As is the case with every big release since Halo 3, Divinity Original Sin 2 released with a fancy collector's edition. It came packed with a Steam key for the game, a collector's box featuring art of all the major races, a combination velvet-lined dice tray and Dungeon Master screen, a Chronicles of Reaper's Coast lore book, a printed map of Reaper's Coast, and the main attraction, a 10.2-inch figurine of Fane. The Kickstarter Collector's Edition was originally supposed to feature a Ouija board to play into the game's theme of channeling spirits. This was scrapped when Larian discovered that Ouija boards were a trademark. On top of that, the community voted against its inclusion and demanded something else in its place. The Collector's Edition had yet another scrapped item, the Dwarves Empire Ale Mug, which was terminated on the grounds that Larian just wasn't satisfied with the quality of the final product. This was replaced by the Fane figurine. All in all, a good trade. Fans and critics alike were in agreement that the game was one of the best they had ever played, with Divinity Original Sin 2 receiving a stellar score of 93 from critics and a solid 8.3 from fans on the almighty Metacritic. GameSpot also believed the game lived up to the hype, awarding it a perfect 10 out of 10. Divinity Original Sin 2 gained even more recognition when it was nominated for Best RPG at the Game Awards 2017, going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Final Fantasy XV, Nier Automata, South Park the Fractured Butthole, and Persona 5. Once again, I'm Jacob, and thanks for watching 100 and seven facts about Divinity Original Sin 2. What do you think about the new installment? Comment below and let us know. Don't forget to click the bell icon to become part of our notification squad, and if you like getting more from your games, subscribe to the leaderboard, your home for video game facts.